Okay. From the Owl's Nest Barbecue Research and Development Studio in Ottawa, Tennessee, it's time for the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show with Steve Ray and his vast array of guests. From right here in Ottawa and from across the barbecue nation, it's time to light the grill, cook the meat, and then repeat. Now live, it's the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show with Steve Ray. Thank you, Emma Grace Ray, for that great introduction. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Al's Nest Barbecue Show, sponsored by Steve Ray's Midnight Oil and Michelin Tires. When you need tires, service, and gasoline, you need us. That's right. And by the complete line of butcher barbecue products, rubs, injections, grilling oils, and accessories. Trust your butcher. Make your next cook out epic with products from Butcher Barbecue, available locally at Steve Ray's Midnight Oil in Old Twa. Folks, we've got a great show lined up for you. In just a few minutes, we'll be bringing on David Bosca, the winner of the Jack Daniels Barbecue Taunt Contest a couple weeks ago. We're going to have a fantastic show for you. But first, I want to remind everybody that we've got these great gift boxes in right now. They just came in. We've got all of our entire shipment in. Here they are. I want to show them to you. This box has got the Butcher Barbecue limited edition label on the front. This box opens up and four, count them, four 12 ounce Butcher Barbecue rubs and seasonings can fit inside this box. You can put some Christmas paper in it. You close it up and you can gift wrap it or you can give it to your favorite barbecue and griller just like so with the four barbecue rubs in it and the handmade custom limited edition box only $69.95 that's right only $69.95 and you get to pick whatever whatever rubber sauce or rubber uh rubber spice you want to put on it that's up to you 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 can do whatever you want put it in there and, and give it to whoever you want they're available in my place Steve Ray's Midnight Oil and Noodle One with Thanksgiving just around the corner I want to tell you about another special thing we've got going <laughs> The Bird Booster Holiday Kit from Butcher Barbecue. In this box contains everything you need to do a 20-pound turkey. It has an injection. It has the um, injection that you put in the bird. It has the uh, seasoning salt, the hickory seasoned salt. It's got a huge Ziploc bag that will hold that turkey, so you can put it, you can inject that bird, put it in that bag, and then put it in your refrigerator overnight. And just let it sit there in the injection where it'll where it will flavor the meat. You know you can brine and brine and brine, and it's you're you're just wasting time. The only way you can get flavor inside a turkey is to inject it. And this right here with the hickory seasoned uh, salt and the uh, injection, it's uh, easy to do. Everything you've got to have is in that box. It's only fourteen dollars and ninety five cents. And it is available at my place, Steve Ray's Midnight Oil in Old Twa. Folks, I'm going to tell you something about these about these butcher barbecue products. You've got cooks. Now, this, these are the cooks that are using this stuff. Right now, Sean Cosby, he is down at the World Food Championship competing in the barbecue competition. He uses butcher barbecue products. Dan Grease, Frank Blair, Brian Thurman, Alvin Selvage, Justin Brown, David Bacon, Lamar Young, and the list goes on and on and on of local barbecue pit masters that are using butcher barbecue products, and they're getting them over at my place at Steve Ray's Midnight Oil. The folks, it's the real deal. Don't, don't even think that it's not because the 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 products that that David Bosca makes are second to none, and they are championship products. and And he proved that again this couple of weekends ago by winning the, the Jack Daniels. Invitational Barbecue Championship. And, and let me tell you this. Now, David, already adding to an impressive resume that includes a World Food Championship Barbecue Champ and, w, and World Food Championship Finalist, the second, win, the second winningest competitor on the hit series Barbecue Pitmasters, the runner-up in the 2018 American Royal Barbecue Contest, and the winner of the 2018 Jack Daniels Invitational Barbecue Contest, and the World Champion Barbecuer of 2018. Folks, let's welcome to Udawa, David Bosca. David, how are you doing tonight? Oh, man. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you letting us come on. Well, your your list of accolades are growing and growing, and, uh, you know, it's a pretty good uh, 
addition to the resume in just uh, about what three three months separating you going from the second place to the American Royal then to uh, winning the Jack Daniels. Yeah, it was a a true blast, and I'm still kind of pinching myself to to make sure it happened to me. David, do you wait? You know, when you win something like the Jack, and and that's like in the equivalent in golf to winning the British Open. I mean, it's it's the biggest thing we've got in this country. Do you, do you feel you feel different in the morning? I mean, do you wake up and say, "Holy mackerel, I, I won that thing"? No, I don't feel any different. I'm just a country boy from Oklahoma that puts a little heat to me. <laughs> well, good deal. And you know, I believe that. Hey, let's um let's talk a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna go over all the meets and all the stuff you did at the uh, at the Jack Down. Everybody is really looking forward to that. And if you have a question for David. Emma is monitoring – my daughter, David, is monitoring Facebook. Emma, have you got the Facebook page pulled up? Yes. And you're seeing no, all the no, – Okay. No, make, no, I don't. Everything. We're having some real internet issues here. No. But, hi, Emma. How you doing? Well, she can't hear you. She's fine. But you'll have to use that microphone, oh, okay. Emma. She'll uh, she'll talk into the microphone when she gets a content – when she gets a uh, a question, I'll have her, her raise her hand. But so don't 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 uh, ask the question, Emma, until you raise your hand and I'll work in, okay? Um you know, now after you were done cooking at the award ceremony, we're going to fast forward just a little bit. When was the moment that David that you realized that you had a shot at winning? I'm going to be honest with you. We did not think we had a shot at it. Well, at the awards or at the trailer at our camp? No, at the at, at the awards first. That's when you got okay, you, okay. you got you got your call and everything like that. Okay. After we. We had the sauce, which doesn't count for overall, but it sure makes it feel good when you get a top sauce call. Chicken, we got third in the chicken, Mm -hmm. and instantly you think, I've given myself a chance, especially with the way they do, you have to turn in white meat. So you're like, okay, I gave myself a chance, let's go from there. We really liked our ribs. We did not get a top 10 in ribs. We ended up, I think, 16th. Um, Pork. We got fourth place in pork, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's two top five calls, which is, boy, I tell you what, you're pretty good. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're, yeah, you're tickled to death with that, and we really liked our brisket. The brisket was out of all four meats. The only one I thought was a half a step behind what I wanted as far as the richness of the flavor. It was, we felt it was cooked perfect. It was juicy. Everything was spot on, but the one thing you really can't control is the meat itself. And I think it was just a half a step behind what we've had all year long. Mm-hmm. But it was good. Don't get me wrong. It was really, really good. Um, so we're just like, man, just any brisket call, and I'll be happy. Um, they go through the brisket, and there ends up in, ends up only being a one person they got three calls out of it and that was darren worth with iowa smoky d's mm-hmm. he's the only one there was several two calls and we were sitting there and i was talking to my brother and my two son-in-laws that come with us and we got a friend from a local town right here that him and his wife traveled out um so i was kind of telling them i can see us being in the top five but you really don't know where but i said man we've given ourselves a chance to be in the top five provided the two other meats just didn't get throttled Mm -hmm. in the judge's eyes and they start naming off the top 10 and some of the guys that i kind of thought might be in the mid pack were already got named off and then they're then in the middle of the pack uh david and a few of the other guys with one call blaine one call got called and i'm like oh my gosh that's one call we might have made the top five and the guy I had at reserve was Tim Shears. Um, they called him out at fourth place. And I went, oh, my gosh. Martin and I look at each other, and I'm like, oh, my God, we might be top three. And they then they called out the, the team for third. And I'm like, oh, my God, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, my eyes, Darren won it. There was no doubt in my mind. Darren Warren won it. Um, um, I'm like, oh, we reserved. We reserved. And Martin and I was like, oh, my goodness. And then Reserve Grand, they called Darren Worth, Iowa Smokey D's. Martin and I look at each other, and we have a buddy there, another team from Oklahoma got to travel. 
he come running across there, and I'm, I tell him, I said, don't you look at me, Scott. Scott, don't you look at me. <laughs> and he says, it's between you and um, team out of Kansas City and everything. They had two calls. And I look at Martin again, I'm like, I forgot about them. So we're literally going, it's them or us. One of the two of us is going to get upset because we got bad tables. Um, and so you don't know. And then just as he's announcing and he says grand champion, and as the word butcher starts coming out of his mouth, it's just total elation, just wow, oh, my God. I mean, you put so much hard work into it, so much time, so much everything, and you're there with your brother that cooks with you all the time, friends, son-in-laws. That's just, I'm just, I mean, flat out, that's all I could do was to hold back the tears as we're walking down between the chairs trying to get to the main aisle. I mean, it's just total, I don't know what to call it, just wow this just happened right um you just i i don't know what to say other than that it was just total wow well what i was going to ask my next really my, my next question was now being being the the great barbecue champion that you are you're you have i'm in it moments all the time when you're when you're cooking at different contests you know you know how it feels you you size up the field and you know at award ceremonies like i'm in this thing as they're calling the names and they're calling the places of all the four proteins. But and I was gonna I was gonna ask you, but I think I already know the answer, but I'll ask you anyway. What what did you feel different when you knew you were in it at the Jack than when you say you're cooking maybe the Wellston, Oklahoma Rotary Club barbecue and car show and you're sitting there at at award ceremony. Is there a different I'm in it feeling between the two? There there has to be. Yeah. Um you, when we turn in our meat and the fourth meat, fourth lid closes, Martin runs it in. We're sitting there and we're going through it. I am the harshest critic of all on my own food. I am as, as true to, uh, uh, oh, I don't know the right word, um, a critic as can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I try to be that judge and find ways to knock my food. Um, there's guy, if, if they can do it, I can do it. And if I can find ways, there's ways they can do it. Mm-hmm. So I, we finished up the four meets, and I'm like, we gave ourselves a chance standing in the trailer. I thought the four meets were good. If I was back home, I would say we could be top two. Mm-hmm. But now we're at the Jack. There's 100 teams, judges from all over the country, maybe the world. I don't know. Um, flavor profiles from California to Mississippi to New York, uh, salt, pepper, sweet, savory. You really have no clue what's going to happen. Yeah, you, you know, sit there and David, and it's such a – that your food's good. And when you go to that judging tent at the Jack, you know, you've got uh, uh, master judges sitting next to uh, J- Jim Cantori, the weather guy from uh, – the Weather Channel judging food. You've got celebrity judges. You've got uh, all kinds. Of, there was a there was a friend of mine from uh, Chattanooga that judged up there, and um, yeah. And so, do you, do you did you cook? Do you cook any different when you know that there might be a? I'm not. I say I'm not gonna say amateur judge, but somebody that doesn't do this a whole lot. Do you or you just you just bear down and and you cook it just like a like a regular KCBS uh, contest. I don't change anything. doesn't matter where I go. Um, it, it, I, I feel like my food is middle of the road. I don't think it's over sweet. I don't think it's over spicy. I don't think it's over savory. Mm-hmm. I think it, the trick to, to winning in great barbecue is the two major things, getting the right food to begin with and getting it cooked properly. They, uh, I think you have to cook it right. Um, and every piece of meat has to be right. Um, and as far as the flavors, like I said, it's not one way or the other. So it doesn't matter where you go, it should be liked. Um, I don't think that, like I said, mine's not sweet, spicy. It's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. You can pick up hints of this. You can pick up hints of that. Um, so we've cooked in California and we've won. We've cooked in Florida and won. We've cooked different places. 
I don't change anything. You know, I've been down deep heart South Texas. We've won. Um, I cook the same thing. People would say, well, that's Kansas City style barbecue. Well, I don't really know about Kansas City style. It's Oklahoma. It's what we cook. Yeah, I think I think the different uh, the different regions is is, is oh way over documented, way over talked about. People people like good food, no matter if it's in North Carolina, Kansas City, San Diego, or Chattanooga, Tennessee. People know what good food tastes yeah. like. Hey, when you were yeah. uh, when y'all were cooking, when you started Friday night, and you were putting the meats on, did was there anything you noticed that um, you know was the brisket a little? Uh, I'm assuming you're cooking wagyu briskets. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, was you know was this a special one? Like were the ribs like man? You know sometimes you know you 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 tear into a pack of ribs and you go wow these things are these things are really really good they're perfect almost. Did did you get that feeling at all? Was you know I know the chicken doesn't. It's hard to tell on chicken, but ribs uh, even a pork butt you can you can kind of tell hey this looks good. Did you did you see any of that? I trim all my meat at the house. Uh, I have already laid hands on it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I set this brisket, I would gotten three briskets. So within the last four weeks of, uh, that month, and I had just taken that one. I said, well, that's a nice steak. When I see some marbling, I'll set that to the side and I'll probably cook that at the jack. Um, that's all that was. And yeah. I pulled it out the Saturday before, let it thaw out. I trimmed it Monday. That's the one I took. I didn't plan on pulling another one out that and trimmed out fine. Okay. We took it. It looked just like the ones I took the week before, two weeks before, three weeks before. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, it looked the same. Um, so I can't say it was extraordinary. Um, the ribs, I I probably had been picking ribs for three weeks. I, I, I'm fortunate. I've been able to – we've got a store here in town that keeps 40 to 50 slabs of ribs at all times in the counter, and they're single packs. So as I go shopping, um, I try to find good ribs. And for the Royal and for this one, I found what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I just set them to the side in the deep freeze. And so other than handpicking, that's as close as I got to handpicking. Yeah. Really, the the chicken, I just buy chicken at the grocery store. I I, I like Tyson chicken. Mm -hmm. I like a big fatty skin. Um, To me, fat's flavor. It's juicy. Um, So that's what we cook. Yeah. So, so you're and buying I, you're buying your chicken. I, I, I guess they'd call it off the rack, then, so so to speak. Yeah, yeah, and ribs too. I buy them at the grocery store. You know that's um, you know, David. That's it's so it's so refreshing to hear you say that because uh, so many times in um, you know in competition barbecue, you're always thinking, hearing about oh, I got I didn't get you know I ordered you know thirty six chicken thighs and not one of them was worth a flip. I ordered. You know this brisket. None of it was any good. You 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 know complaints, complaints, complaints. You know wine, wine, wine. Cry, cry, cry. And then and then I've always wondered, you know, if if you order stuff, you're 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 putting yourself at the mercy of the person that packed it in the cooler. You know, no. Yeah. So don't complain if you get something you don't like because they're they're thinking. You know, they may be a competition cook working where they're shipping stuff. They might be keeping all the good stuff for themselves. Well, I, I know exactly what you're saying. But yeah, chicken. I buy the big jumbo eight pack chickens um, at the grocery store. Um, <laughs> so, and, and I I usually buy two of the eight packs. I only cook ten pieces of chicken thighs. Um, and at the Jack, we had to cook breast. We so have I did buy some chicken breast. Hey, David, we've got a question from a um, a, huh. a listener, John Solberg from Michigan's got a question. Go ahead, Emma. What knives does Dave use, and how does he care for them? Oh, well, that's a real easy question and answer. I, I like that question. Uh, my favorite knife is a Forstner brand, um, R.H. Forstner. Um, as far as caring for them, we, we use a knife holder in the trailer. We keep them up in that. Uh, I use a steel. My favorite steel is an F, as in the, like, Frank, period, Dick, D-I-C-K. F. Dick is the brand. Mm-hmm. And the trick to carrying or taking care of it is to use your steel before you need it, before it goes dull. A steel will not put the edge back on, will not put the bevel on a knife. All it does is pull what bevel there is back to the center, which keeps it sharp. Um, if you work a knife all the way through, say, an hour's worth of cutting and never hit the steel, 
you're you're beyond. You've already rounded out your blade, so you need to keep your the center of the blade to the center. And and that's the biggest trick I can tell people is is use a steel. Learn how to use your steel properly, um, and make sure your steel is a good one. Um, a good metal steel needs to be magnetized. If it's not magnetized, throw it away and get a new one. Um, there's reasons for that, and it's got to do with pulling the fibers off of the knife blade. Um, so if it, you got a metal steel and it's not magnetized, uh, get rid of it. It is time for a new one. And 34 years of cutting meat, I've probably have only owned four of them. Um, so they last a long time. Now, John's got a follow-up question. Go ahead, Emma. Yes. Is that the same knife you butchered with? That is correct. That is correct. I used a, a six-inch semi-stiff. Um, boning knife. That's, that's the one I'm speaking of right here. Mm -hmm. I did, I do use a, a, a 10 inch breaking knife, uh, when we were slaughtering animals, um, for brisket, I use a 12 inch brisket slicer and they're all RH Forstner brand products. But you know, David, that one you sell on your website, it's a, um, uh, that seven inch bony knife. I bought a couple of those. Uh, I have found that is the, I mean, that's the go-to knife. I had a you know big wide collection of uh, Gunner Wilhelms, but that one, uh, what's the brand you sell on the website? The Forstner. That's exactly yeah, what I'm talking about. That is, is that is that a Forstner? Yeah. That knife, yes, it it, that's in, that that seven inch. That's incredible. I mean, it is yep. it is yeah. incredible. And I'm glad you I'm glad you talked about the steel because I didn't know if I was trimming the meat right because I I kept having to go back and you know especially brisket after you've been trimming that those, those big fat caps and those briskets I'd have to go back and I'd be sharpening that thing again and I'd get a couple you know maybe work it for about five minutes and you know you can tell when that thing gets a little bit of a, a dullness to it and then you, I guess that's, that's when you yeah. got to bring it right to the center isn't it Yep yep that's right and you know that that knife. Folks, it's it's not expensive. I think it's what is it, twenty four dollars on your Yeah, I mean, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very affordable. I mean, you know, we spend you know, barbecue people, gosh, the sky's the limit on uh knives. Guys, go out and buy some Gunner Wilhelms or something someday and you'll get uh you'll get sticker shock. Uh let's see. Thank John, thank you very much for that question. We appreciate it. And Emma, thank you for um uh reading that. Hey David, when you were cooking, when you and Martin were cooking in the, in your two son in laws, when you were when you, as 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 the as the meat was being cooked and the contest was going on, did you did did you hit all your marks? Did did you have any problems? Did everything seem to go like, oh my gosh, this is going really smoothly? Or you know, did you have to? Were you pulling meat, pinning it, putting it back? It seems like when I have a bad cook, I'm I'm pulling meat off, putting it back on, pulling it off, putting it on, and that's not good. But I'm trying to you know I'm trying to get it to the right temperature. How did how did you how did the the basic you know, the, the, the long cooks go. I, it was uneventful. Um, the Jack starts their turn ins 30 minutes later than standard. Mm -hmm. So your chicken starts at 1230 versus 12. So things are off a little bit, but on our big meats, we just ran them normal. So we understood the timeline and they were, yeah, it was uneventful for the big meats. Um, when it comes to the small meats, the ribs and the chicken seemed like there was three categories I was cooking. You have your ribs going on 30 minutes later than normal, but then you have your chicken, but then you got to add white meat to it. Yeah. That, what, do you so, do? what do you do with that? Well, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because that is, okay. that's a little bit. So as, but as, as far as the cook, um, I, I'm going to say hectic, uh, after the big meats were off, holding them in a cambro. Ribs were going, ribs were off. Uh, I still had two meats going, mm -hmm. white meat, dark meat. So I had to really stay on top of it, and I was running my head the whole time going, okay, 11 o'clock I do this, so it's 11.30 now. 11.15 I do this, it's um, 11.45. So I was doing a lot of that. Yeah. But as far as missing a step or anything, no, I don't feel like I missed a step. Well, obviously you didn't. If you if you came if you came away with the win, all right. What's what we're going to do, David? If you would, if you'd be so kind as to help us, and and any, anybody listening out there, please jump in. If you've got a question, don't do not hesitate to ask it. Put it on Facebook, and um, Emma will read it off for us. We're going to go through the all the different meats that they David turned in. Hang on, David. I've got them all pulled up here. It should be pretty easy to find. And we're going to start with the chicken. 
that is a pork but there's the chicken right there i've got your i've got your boxes on the uh television screen sure. um right. beautiful they're beautiful boxes too by the way let me see if i can bring this up just a little bit just a second yeah there we go um you've got the row of uh white meat down the middle and uh chicken thighs on each side of it is that correct yep tell us um all right, let's go over the chicken cook, okay? Okay. Chicken cook was uneventful as far as it coming out like I wanted. The reason so is I usually, before we go to the jack, usually about a month before, we start cooking chicken breast. Um, not to try to get the exact method I want, but we put it into our process to where we know that we don't, we aren't trying to do two things at one time that are very vital. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got to do this to the chicken breast. Oh my God. Right now is when I got to be doing this to the thigh too. And then something gets off. Um, so we, we've always started cooking chicken breast about a month early, start putting it in the process so that it's normal. By the time we get to the Jack, um, we understand the next step is this. We prep, we, we get things sitting on the table. We're not jumping around the trailer, grabbing it out of the cabinet. Uh, so to start with chicken, start it in your process. Okay. As far as the prepping of the chicken, we, we prepped everything Friday. Like we always do. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of specific, well, pardon me, specific questions. Um, we use our honey rub on the that's, chicken. That's what, that was going to be the next thing. We want to, we want to know the uh, yeah. butcher brand, what we used on it. Yeah, we use um, Love the Rotisserie Chicken. That's my, my go-to favorite injection. So you do inject, um, did you inject the, uh, the breast and the uh, thighs? I did not inject the breast till the morning of. Oh, okay. Okay. Because every time I've done that, it seems like the chicken breast gets rubbery. That that actually changes the, the muscle structure, and I've never cared for it. Mm -hmm. So I left the chicken breast untouched until the morning of the of the of turn in. Uh, but the thighs, I did what I always do. We inject them right off the bat. As soon as we get meat inspected, I go through and I do pork, pork brisket, ribs, chicken. Chicken goes to bed, nice chest, and I don't touch it till the next morning. Um, how, so many, how, many, um, how many breasts? How many? How many thighs do you usually cook? Ten. Is that all? Yeah, huh. I'm done. Yep. Not much room for error, is there? You must have done this a few times. Uh, <laughs> no, I I cook one brisket, two butts, three ribs, and ten pieces of chicken. That's all we ever cook ever. And uh, on the uh, chicken, what were the rubs, the butcher barbecue rubs that you use? My on the on the thighs, honey rub. That's my go-to mm -hmm. main main rub on that chicken thigh. On the breast, we did our honey rub and a light hint of with our grilling addiction. I love that grilling addiction. Honey rub and grilling addiction. Yep, and that's on the breast. On the on the breast. On and the, the breast. And on the and on the uh, thighs, just the honey rub all by itself, nothing else. Yeah. Now, now let's get into the, uh, cause I, I did this a couple of weeks ago when I was cooking chicken, I used, uh, the, uh, regular grilling, uh, butter flavored oil, like you said before, instead of using, uh, uh, -huh. uh and, butter uh, and, yeah, and, and David, it, it's, that. it's David, it makes, it's unbelievable how, how much better it tastes than using uh, the blue bottle. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, the oil itself, the, the, what it actually does is, is wonders. And we do a, a an oil bath, uh, and we use our Chipotle oil in our bath. In the chicken. So, in with the chicken, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, what he's talking about, he puts the uh, the thighs in a pan, a half pan. And uh, David, you just do, do you go around the sides, or you just uh, coat each chicken thigh, or how do you, how do you do that? No, I, I, I'm, I do just let it go into the pan itself mm -hmm. um, after we put the thighs in the pan and the chicken breast. I did the same way. I don't like coating the meat with the oil because what we have found is when you do that, it builds a barrier and then your rub cannot stick to the, the, the any of the meats. Okay. So I, I, I like to put the rub on it, then let it go with that. Yeah. And then you cook it. Uh, what temperature do you cook to usually on chicken? Two to finish it? Yeah. Okay. 
chicken thighs, 195 degrees. Wow. That high. Yep, you that see, high. You see, that, I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna, I'll tell you what we do, man. That's oh, I know. I am. Oh, I know. Somebody and I, and I, the house, I, I'll tell them the same thing. Oh, I know. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Degrees. Well, you know, I, I was always when when I was taught 160 to 165. See, yeah, so that's, so that's, that's a now you know that, that's, that's a big really, difference though, isn't it? Between that's 30 oh, degrees huge. difference. That's huge. Yeah. And uh, yep. and uh, I guess you got bite through skin. Do you, do you think that uh your cooking oil does that help get you some uh? The bite, bite through skin on the on the thighs? No, I don't think that helps it. Okay. Um, if anything, it might hinder it. But what I do is after I put it in my smoker and I've, I've cooked it, let's see, it goes, goes on at 9 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, it comes out of the smoker uh -huh. and it goes in the grill. So the grill is at a high temp. It's at 350 degrees. I think that's where I get my bite through skin at. Do you leave them in, do you, so you leave them in the, you don't put them in the, you leave it in the pan, right? It, it's in the pan for 30 minutes on the grill. On the grill. And that, that butter gets, oh, that oil gets very hot. And I think that's what helps it. And then we take it back out. We remove it from the pan and we put it back on there for five to seven minutes just to kind of dry up that oil and, and reset the rubs. And then we pull it back in, sauce it, go back into the smoker and set the sauce um, yeah. for five, six, eight minutes. Get a little smoke yeah. flavor on it and, and let it roll. But you don't you don't ever cover it during the process. No. You, you didn't ask me that. I do cover it. Um for the first thirty minutes in the grill while it's in the pan, I lay a piece of foil over the top. Oh you do? Yeah. Okay, so that's where you cover it then. Yeah. Okay. Well that's neat. All right. And that's uh in the um the white meat, not not cooking. I haven't done much white chicken meat, and, and a lot of people, I guess that uh, that barbecue, you know, dark meat always tastes better. What what is the with the what's with the white meat at the jack? What what did that come from? Do you know? Um, I don't know the history of it. I just know since we've been doing it, white meat is required, and they do make you have a minimum of seven pieces at the box. And they do, did tell us that's got to do with Jack Old Number Seven, so they want seven pieces in. But now I don't know what the actual thought process was when they started using white meat. I'm sure it came from the first cook-off, but I don't know why they did that. Yeah, it's kind of maybe to show what a real, yeah. real champion cook is. Well, maybe, it, I don't, I don't really know. I'd like to like to speculate a lot of things, but who knows? It's hard to, you know, well, it's harder to cook, isn't it? I mean, it, I think yeah, it, it I, takes. It takes more talent to cook white chicken meat. Yeah, I just assume the Jack do away with chicken, and we go to like something like sausage or something. I like. <laughs> I don't know. You know, chicken ain't my I favorite. I don't think they let you make the rules when you win, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's go to uh, let's go to my favorite. Uh, one of my favorite entries is uh, pork ribs. And folks, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to ask on Facebook. We'll uh, we'll we'll get your question on. I promise you. My daughter Emma here is. Uh, assisting today and uh, she'll be glad to read any questions you have for david we're going to move on to ribs um there's a rib box i have behind me david they're glistening uh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ribs in the box and i see just a little bit of uh is that parsley or uh, lettuce i can't tell i'm a lettuce box builder okay um, but we use parsley for borders oh okay oh double guy okay i've, I've seen that done um Put the ribs on. Ribs, let's see, ribs would turn in at one o'clock, right? That would be correct, yes. All right. So what time do they go? What time do you those go on? And you use uh take it real quick, tell everybody what, what smoker you use because you know, I you know, I don't know if you remember this, but a few years ago I made a, a comment. We were we were watching a uh our friend uh Greg Rempe on the barbecue central show and you were in the chat room and I said if Ben Lang had made a pellet smoker, you'd have been the the you would have been the uh, barbecue pitmasters champion in whole hog, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but tell That's everybody what other story. <laughs> I know, but tell everybody what you uh, tell everybody what you use because I think this is going to surprise a lot of people. I cook on FEC one hundred. That's Fast Eddies by Cook Shack. They are pellet smokers. Um, I use two pellet smokers and one pellet grill. Uh, I actually use their pellet grill. Mm -hmm. I've got a Traeger and I used Traeger a little bit last year for half the year. 
Um, in all honesty, I got just tired of running around trying to drag four smokers. So yeah, it's, I cut, cut out one of them. Um, you can but, get too yeah, much I stuff. Use, I'm a pellet grill cooker. So that's, um, you know, a lot of people pellet, you know, pellet grills, David, there, I know they've been popular and how long you've cooked on this pellet grill you've had for what? I think you, I heard you say somebody tell somebody 15 years, 10 years. Two two thousand seven was the first contest I went to. Eleven years. And I'm still cooking on the very first pellet smoker I ever took. It's still in my trailer. So, um folks don't ever don't let anybody tell you you can't win with a pellet smoker because uh by golly you can. All right, let's get back to ribs. Um put them on what time? Turn in was at one, so you were on at uh what time? Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. At what temperature are you cooking ribs? I start at two thirty. Mm-hmm. And an hour and a half in, I take it to 260. And you're watching, um, are you looking for temperature or are you looking, are you more of a, uh, a feel and a, uh, you know, what they look like guy? On the first part, uh, it's it's all timing to me. I, I put them on at eight, at 930, I wrap them. And then I, I'm a temperature guy. I pull them off at 206 degrees. Mm-hmm. And usually that's going to be, between 10 30 10 45 but here with everything a little later it was right at 11 when they came off yeah. so so you pull them two two hours before turning you're taking them off do they go in the cambro no i set them on top of the smoker and just lay a towel over the top wow and they just stay there for a couple hours oh yeah they're so hot you can't even touch them i'll be darned yeah I, I've, I've thrown them in the cambro but I, we've always cooked trying to get the ribs done almost right before turn in. So I didn't, I didn't know if, if you could hold ribs that long. See, you know, yeah, I like, it's so, I, it's so, it's so, it's so fun talking to different, different cooks because there's so many, you know, there's so many ways to get to Chicago. You know, you no, don't well, have, you don't have to right. go the same way. There's not any one right or wrong way. It's just what works for you. And that's the ultimate thing about pit mastering. The more pit mastering is very circumstantial. The more circumstances you've been in, the more you know what to do. Mm-hmm. Now, chicken breast add to the mix. Um, someone wants to add um, um, oysters to the mix. Um, you just the more you've been in, the more you know what to do. Ribs. I have found with my method, coming off an hour and a half or so prior to turning in has been my favorite. Um, two hours, it ain't hurt them. They sit there and do just fine. Yep. Now, what what rubs are you using on your ribs? I put a thin layer of the grilling addiction, mm-hmm. honey rub, and then my premium rub. In that order on both sides. Grilling, honey, premium. Yes, yep. I had to stop and think. <laughs> I, had now, to, I had to rub my ribs right here. <laughs> now, what uh, now what are you using as as a binder? Uh nothing. Just spray a little bit of water. Water, yep, good. Just, that's that's what yeah, I that's all I do. That's what I try to tell people. You don't need you don't need all the other fancy stuff. Water works just fine. And I remember, I, water, I remember watching you on television. You explained that that you uh, that rubs and spices, they pull moisture out of the meat, and uh, you put water on to add to hydrate the meat. Is that correct? I do it to hydrate the rubs. Yes. I oh, mean, okay. you got to think of what the rub, what the rub itself is. It's it's dried garlic. It's dried celery. It's it's salt. It, it's it's the dried sugars, and you got it's got to rehydrate before it can soak into the meat. So if you put it on a the, the dried product on the, the, the layer of the meat, it's going to have to pull moisture out of the meat to rehydrate before it can ever start going in. I, my whole goal is to have a moist piece of meat. So I add moisture to the outside layer so that it rehydrates. Then it can start going in without anything coming out of the meat. And so then you wrap them at, um, let's see, what is the total time on that? You would say at 930. They're, they're yeah. on at eight. You wrap them at nine 30. And I'm assuming, um, tell me what you put in there in the foil. Real simple. I, I use a light, light amount of brown sugar, honey, and bacon fat. Bacon fat. Hmm. Yeah. Have you thought about, have you thought about maybe trying to create a, um, a product that goes in there where you can just like add water to it? Oh, years ago, my son and I, we, we called, in the meat shop, we come up with dozens of different things to, to put out on the market. But there's always something I always ask before I do that, and it's what demand is there and what the demand does it cure? How many people can actually use it? Right. 
And can I make, I can I, and can I make money with it? <laughs> yeah, I just don't feel that there's a demand for a rib wrapping product. There is a product out there. Um, it was it's funny. We Levi and I was talking about this for about a year, and nah, I didn't want nothing like that. I just didn't see it being a huge product. Okay, competition guys would 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 eat it up. Outside of competition, no one even knows what that kind of stuff is. Right. So. There is a product out there, whether it sells or not, that's his business. I don't know. But did I think about it? Oh, yeah, in the past I had. Yeah, long time ago. Hey, David, when you're, when you're making these products up, and um, for folks, folks who are just joining us, we're, we're, we're speaking with David Bosco, the owner of Butcher Barbecue. You can get his products at my place. He raised Midnight Oil in Ultawan. David just won the uh, Jack Daniels 2018 Invitational Barbecue Championship just a few weeks ago in Lynchburg, uh, Tennessee. And when when you're making a, a product, David, um, I always try to take my you take my contest knowledge and combine it with uh, backyard knowledge when I'm cooking for friends. Is, when you're when you're coming up with a product, are you are you thinking more of a a contest person or are you thinking more of the backyard person? You still there, uh-huh. David? You there, David? We seem to have lost a David real quick. Let me call him right back real quick. This should only take just a few minutes. Brent, you hang in there. I see you've got a question. We're going to try to get a hold of David real quick here. Hold on just a second. Let's see. Call ended. Let me go over here. We'll do this. You said they were having, I think they were having. Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, David, I'm back. Sorry about that. Yeah. We've got some real bad cell towers going on right now. Yeah. That's what, um, that's what I had gathered. Uh, Emma's got a question from you. There's a gentleman, um, has a question. Emma, can you read that please? Uh, Use a microphone. Uh, okay, hang on. And for your ribs and brisket, do you believe in butcher paper, peach paper, or aluminum foil for wrapping? You said foil, but I just want to confirm. Thank you, and congrats once again on the win at the Jack. And David, that is from Brent Little. He is watching us from Sao Sa- uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. By the way, Brent, thanks a lot for watching, and we really appreciate the question. In competitions, I use aluminum foil, okay? At home, I will use butcher paper and aluminum foil both on different things. I still like foil for ribs, Mm -hmm. but I will use butcher paper on brisket around the house. Does that um, that make the bark a little harder? Um, It does help, absolutely. Um, And in the FECs, to me, it just helps with everything like that. I, I, I have no problems with the butcher paper. Um, I, I, uh, I I cook a little funny, um, in all honesty, as far as around the house, because every time I cook, I'm still cooking for testing or something like that. And I'm just trying to still find that perfect way to make a butcher paper brisket competition worthy. Hey, David, before we got cut off, I was asking you about when you were designing products, are you designing them more for the competitor in mind, or are you thinking about the, the backyard cook? A little bit of both, in all honesty. Um, I saw competitive archery for many, many, many years. And one of the uh, things that was brought to my attention back then was competition archery was less than 5% of the total boat sales that a manufacturer would do. Mm-hmm. And in this world here, I would – Total sales, I bet it's less than that um, as far as what's being cooked um, in the backyard. Our product is probably a lot larger because we do have injections and we do cater to that market and then we do have a lot of rubs. But in total sales coming out of a high-end or a specialty barbecue store, I would still say competition archery is only 10% of the sales. David, uh, Clifford Aspie has a question. Emma, go ahead. When you rest, no, the 
when you rest the wrapped ribs, do you drain off with the wrap juice mixture? When it's the ribs are finished, I'm assuming is what he's talking about. Yeah. I do not open those ribs up until I'm slicing. Oh wow! So they sit in uh, so they sit in their own juice. That's a good. That's a great question, Cliff. Juice. That's a great question, and let me give you a little back reasons why. I said I take my ribs to 206 degrees, and that is where I like to uh, pull them out at. Um, they need to continue tenderizing. Well, a lot of people don't realize is meat starts breaking down between 175 and 195 that's the tenderizing time frame that's when the connective tissue start coming apart okay mm -hmm. um if you scream through that system like today's world of cooking is hot and fast you have to take your food to a higher temperature so that you still get that much connective tissue broke down to its tender to bite that's the old low and slow method is we would cook briskets for 14, 16, 18 hours. Right. Well, you would only have to take it to 195. That's because it's set for six hours in that method. Okay. That's the, the way of thinking. And uh, uh, even a slower method is sous vide cooking. You can have a chicken breast completely tender, but it might take 12 hours to cook. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that being said, I take to a 206. Now, what people aren't realizing is it's still above that 195, and so it's still breaking down connective tissues. If I open up that foil one time and I blast cool air to them and slow them down and take it to, say, 190 degrees instantly, okay, wrap it back up and let it set, I have shut down probably 45 minutes, 30 minutes of tenderizing time right. from 206 as it's, as it's going back down through the process. A lot of people don't think of the, the, the downward temperature time is as important as the time going up. And that's so really, and, method, and that's really, yeah. if you're looking, you're not cooking when, it, when you're getting in, down to that, when it's in that form. Yeah, yeah. And it, so, so your total tenderizing time you may think that, oh, I'm going to pull them off at 195 or say 200. It works for you. 200, and you open them up one time, and they're a little tight. Oh, they tightened up after I sliced them. No, they tightened up before you ever pull them out. Right. Um, but you can pull them out at 200 degrees, never open them up, slice them, and they're going to be in a lot better shape because you never put a blast chill to them and stopped the cooking process. All right. Let's move over to... Let's see. Yeah, let's move over to the pork. I've got your pork box up. Looks like you did uh, uh, money muscles on each side. And um, I guess that was uh, those tubes or just pulled? Just a little bit of pull. Just a little pull to pull. Where you, um, first of all, where you, uh, I know where you're getting the money muscle from. And those are, um, those look great. Where you, where are you pulling it from, David? I, I, I work with two muscles, basically. One of them will be what's the bacon muscle on the bottom mm -hmm. or the little bitty small horn muscle, the dark meat horn muscle. I will get it from one of those two spots. My, it's my two favorite spots. Now, that little horn muscle, I've, I've, I've seen you demonstrate how you pull that out of a, uh, a butt. That's a, um, that, that's a really tender piece of meat that a lot of people don't, I, I guess they don't even look for, isn't it? Yeah, if it was on a cow, and today's world, they've marketed all the way to the point where now it's called a flat iron steak. Uh -huh. That would be the same muscle on a cow. Okay, and it's um, and it, and obviously it's tender because it looks fantastic. Uh, what is the um, what are the rubs that we're using on our pork butts? A uh, light addition of the grilling. The uh, and and through the summer, I'm gonna be honest. I bounced around a little bit. Um, I played with the sweet chipotle. I played with the savory chipotle, but uh, the, the honey rub and the premium has always been a great go-to on that. Mm -hmm. But I, I have even used our hickory salt. Um, but when I did that, I did not use the grilling addiction. But the grilling addiction and the premium rub works great together on pork. I think it needs that to carry through because it's such a big piece of meat and there's so much internal fat. It needs a, a good, strong rub to... To, to give it a flavor. And David, talk about how important it is to uh, uh, inject that pork butt. To me, it's extremely important. Um, 
the pork butt is so thick. You just, to me, pork butt is very blonde flavor. Yeah. So I think injecting it gets a flavor where you want it. I use a combination of two of our injections. I use our open pit injection and our regular pork injection. The open pit has some dried molasses and some good, good amount of pepper in it. So it has a, a very unique and distinctive flavor that just goes with pork. And I think combined with our normal pork injection, it really makes it stand out good. And uh, what's the what's the the cooking method? It goes in. You, are you in a pan or are you right on the uh, rack? I go right on, I go right on the grate. Okay. Right on the grate. I, the only time we wrap is when we're wrapping in the morning. Um, I'm at that pork sets unopened. Fat side up or down? Fat side down. And I use that to because in the FECs the um, heat comes from the bottom, mm-hmm. so I use the fat as the as the shield for my airflow. And uh, what? Tell me what's the what's the method on that? You go to how far? How high do you go before you wrap a butt? Uh, about 150 degrees. Yeah, and then wrap it, and then go to. I I only probe the money muscle when I'm taking it off. That's all that's important to me. Mm-hmm. I don't cut it off and put it back in and finish it. I'm probing the money muscle, and it needs to be about 202 for me. 203, right there. Um, according to how much marbling's in it. If it's super, super heavily marbled, 201, 202. Mm-hmm. If it's not very marbled, I'll hit 203 with it. David, are you, do you are you cut the butt down to, uh, you know, a lot of guys now are just, you know, they're, they're taking that butt and they're whittling it down to, I think, I was a 4. 4.1 pounds is the smallest thing no. you can cook. No, no, I don't do that. I clean up the money muscle, top and bottom. Other than that, I just make sure there's no bone slivers across the top where they pull the spare ribs off. Other than that, I leave it alone. Okay. Well, then, so um, uh, let's see. Emma, is there another question? Well, it says, how long do you let the ribs sit on the pork butt? Where did you answer that already? How long, how long do I uh, – repeat that, please. Repeat that, Emma. What's, what's the question again? How long do you let the rub sit on the pork butt? Oh, nice question. Oh, yeah, that is a good question. The morning, the morning of the cook that we're going to cook them, so it be Saturday morning in a competition, about 5.30 in the morning, I put rub on the ribs for a traditional start 7.30 time, which would be the standard turn-in for a 12.30. Here, everything was backed up 30 minutes. But normally at 5.30 in the morning, I put uh, rubs on the rib. That's a good question. And let's, let's see. Let's move over to the last one, my favorite my favorite thing to cook in the whole wide world is a brisket, and there it is. And David, that's that's a David, that's a beautiful box. I mean, for everybody at home looking at that, that is that is you know you know they say when you're you're judging a barbecue contest, the way you judge a box is does that make you want to reach down in there and grab that food? And this one, you hit your mark on that one, David. I bet I bet you. Yeah. Did, I bet. What did you score on that brisket? Do you remember? One seventy. One seventy. So I thought yep. it'd be higher than that. Let's talk about that brisket a little bit. What? What? What are, we, are you? You're of course you're injecting that one, right? Yep. We use our prime injection. Yep. And um, I use vegetable stock as my liquid. I've always done that for a long, long time. Um, I just I've got a belief going that. What's our rubs on the outside but dried vegetables? So let's put just a little bit of that inside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I use a good vegetable broth. Yeah. And then what um what do you put on top? I'm, I'm sure the steak and brisket rub. Grilling grilling addiction. Grilling addiction. <laughs> You're starting to see a pattern here. Well, right? what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all that other stuff and just get in 50 <laughs> cases of grilling addiction, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just uh, – I, I'm the world's worst. Once I find something I like, I just bang. I go to town with it. <laughs> well, it's you know, it's the it's the second biggest seller we've got behind the honey rub. That's I uh, yep I I, I agree. Um, grilling addiction premium rub, two of the basics that that's worked forever. Yep. And you know, David, so many people are so many people are afraid to cook a brisket, and uh, I've never understood that. Uh, go through your, um, go through the method on your brisket and be, if you're, if you're afraid to cook a brisket and I've talked with several people about this, man, don't be, don't be afraid of a brisket for, for God's sakes. And David, take us through it. So you, people will 
have the confidence to put one on the smoker this sure. week. Sure. Yeah. Brisket is a great big hunk of meat. Um, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, it's a little expensive. And it is kind of um, intimidating to spend $25, $35, $40, $50 $50 on a brisket and and be scared to mess it up. We sell several types of injections for briskets, and that is a huge plus. Yeah. The, the liquefied injection we have is great for the backyard cook. It is our prime injection already liquefied. So you can get that. It's a single-use item. Um, inject it and what that does more than anything else is it just helps assure if you use or do a a good standard cook and I mean it doesn't stupefy it but it sure helps it you don't have to be as concerned about it being juicy it really helps with that so now concentrate on getting it cooked right that's the biggest thing that injecting a brisket can do once you get it um, injected, um, apply a little rub to it. Whatever your favorite is. If your favorite is the premium, go with it. If it's the um, uh, pecan rub or the private seasoning or the steak and brisket, go with what you like. Um, put it on the brisket. Let it set a minimum four hours, mm-hmm. okay? I like it to set longer. I, I'm an 8- to 12-hour person, but that's personal preference. It works into our competition methods. And even here at the house, I can do it one night, let it set overnight, then get up and put it on. It just works that way for me. David, would, um, I, be, would I be incorrect if I, if I speculated that a brisket accepts rubs better than probably any other meat, meaning it, the, bris, the rub will actually get into the meat a little deeper than, say, a pork butter or ribs? No, I don't think you're off on saying that at all. I think you can taste it more because I've, I've always thought so. Just, yeah, beef accepts it better. Yeah, yeah. So you put it on the smoker at um, let's see, turn in is at one thirty. So you're going on at what time? Is that right? Standard standard. No, turn two o'clock. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Yeah, though, at, at the, the jacket. jacket was two o'clock. Standard turn ins at one thirty. Um, if I was be cooking low and slow, my brisket could be on at nine o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. Okay. 3.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, I'd be taking that FEC. And we cook them really, really slow if I was doing a low and slow. I'm going to kind of give you two time frames okay. to help out a little bit with some of the different people that don't want to cook hot and fast. Let's say you're cooking and you want to do a low and slow. On those FECs or if you got a pellet grill, turn it down to 180 or so. You can cook probably five, six hours, get some good smoke added to it, um, wrap it up at that point. Or... Turn it up to about 230 degrees and start setting that bark a little more. Let that bark kind of crisp up and dry up just a little bit. You're not pulling that much uh, temp- or temperature or moisture out of that meat. Once that muscle gets to about 150 degrees, wrap it. Don't wait till 175 like you would always hear. Uh, then you're going to have what's called the traditional stall period. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went through a huge thing of this, I think, on yours last time. Um, don't You need to wrap it earlier. It, it takes moisture in the muscles to make it finish cooking. Um, so don't be scared of it. If you want to cook a little hot faster, start it at about 260 degrees. If Let's just say you got a regular grill. If you want a charcoal on one side um, or if you want in a pellet grill, start, start around 260, 275. Um, Keep a little spray bottle there. Make sure it doesn't um, get too warm. Every time you spray it, it cools it off about three to five degrees. Mm-hmm. It takes it about twenty minutes to come back up. So if you're if you're running a little hot, you can spray it down and cool the meat off a little bit. Um, but in competitions, I start at two hundred and sixty degrees. Um, I put it on at five thirty in the morning, and at six uh, six thirty, I just pick up the brisket and I rotate it front to back. Just simply due to airflow in my in my cooker. That's you, that's why. I do are you that. cooking fat side up or down? Fat side you down. Okay. But you know, David, yeah. a, a, a brisket though is, um, I think, for the backyard guy, and and for for the uh, the taste of it, I think I think the low and slow method is. I just think they taste better, don't you? When they when they've been cooked, you know, overnight. Here at the house, 
just like your last question there with the brisket being foil or paper here at the house that's exactly what i've been playing with i like the the butcher paper wrap briskets low and slow yeah um it just works um there's a time true time method that traditionally is cooking beef and that's it right there i still think that i i know of only one team in a competition world that has never wrapped a brisket never wrapped a brisket in competition and and I'm going to tell you, they have, they've been in the top three in brisket several, several times um, in team of the year, not mm-hmm. just in one cook-off, several times in team of the year, and they don't wrap a brisket. They're the only team I know that, can, that has a method down that perfect. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to perfect it myself. I'd like to see that method. I want to try to do it. Um, yeah. And I think it'll make a killer brisket. Yeah, Emma, they got one. Got a question, Emma? Yes, from Jerry DePew. Do you separate the point and flat in the competition? Absolutely. I separate it every single time. And the reason so is you take a flat where it gets really thick, where it sets on top of that point. That's where I want my slices coming off. And if it's really thick, that means the opposite end is going to get dried and overcooked before that end can get finished. So I separate it from the get-go. For that, in Oklahoma terms, that means the beginning. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I separate the brisket when we, uh, before it ever gets on the cooker so that I got an even cook from one end to the other end of that brisket. And you can go to YouTube and watch David um, David Bosca's uh, Butcher Barbecue YouTube channel, and he will show you how to trim a brisket for competition, trim a brisket for just regular use, and he'll also show you how to separate a brisket. And um, separating a brisket is, I think, what scares a lot of people, David. But once you figure out what you're doing, it's 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 really the easiest thing in the world to do when you figure out what you're trying to uh, separate. Yeah, yeah, you got to know Mother ma- Mother Nature makes every mark on a piece of meat. You just have to know where to hit it. You just got to um, follow that's, it. It's, that's, it's like a little a road fact. map, isn't it? That's right. That's absolutely a fact. If not, um, go watch Pitmasters on how to how to cut up a turkey. <laughs> that's classic. <laughs> David, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We, you don't know how much we appreciate this. We appreciate uh, the mini barbecue seminar. And, and I want everybody to, at home, you can take – the information when you when you listen to this, if you I know you'll be re-listening to this to write down the things that David said. You can take this and you can make it work in your backyard. And and David, they'll if they use your products and use your methods, they'll cook better barbecue, won't they? Oh yeah, I, I think it just takes it takes baby steps, getting comfortable. And I'm a firm believer in. On your grill outside your house, if it's a Weber or a gas grill or, or whatever it is, start with low temperatures. You can control low temperatures more than you can right over something that's 500 degrees. You'll char it way too quick, and, and it'll get either done or overdone. Um, go low and slow even on your grill. I think it just makes makes it easier. There's no doubt about it. David, thank you so much. And, and once again, congratulations on your great win at the Jack Daniels and uh, what's the next, uh, what's the next stop for butcher barbecue on the tournament trail here in a few weeks, we'll be headed to California for the King of the smokers. And that's a biggie. And if yeah. you, yeah. I'm if excited. you, and if you get, if you get that one, we'll have you back on. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like your plan. David, thank you so much. We appreciate you. You bet. Thanks for having us on. Uh, you bet. David Bosque, everybody from, from uh, Chandler Wellston, Oklahoma on the phone with us. I want to thank you everybody for watching and listening. And thanks for the great, great questions. Uh, David, David Bosque is just a, one of the nicest guys in the world. And you can you find all his products at my place, at midnight oil in old Twi. everything that David was talking about, the injections, the rubs, the different kind of rubs, we stock them and, and we'll be glad to show you, uh, you know, where they're at and how to use them. And, and if you want to, you know, talk some barbecue when you come by, when you get, you know, getting your tires on, getting your oil changed or something like that, we'll be glad to do it. Matter of fact, if you want to come by the, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, 
we'll be doing a huge turkey and pork butt cook right there in front of the gas station. We're welcome to come by and, um, you know, visit with us and we'll, uh, you know, go over anything that you want to go over. Emma, thank you so much for helping me. Well, sure. Appreciate it. You can talk in that microphone if you want to say thank you, dad. Thank you, dad. You're welcome. Everybody. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next Wednesday night right here on Facebook on the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show with Steve Ray. Until then, please drive safely and cook like a champion, everybody.